Um, this is the first Tuesday webinar that is hosted by the Washington State Library. We've been doing this for a number of years. We're going to go through a few introductory slides. First is not advancing. Let's see, try this again. There I am. That's me. I am your facilitator, which basically just means you get to hear me for a few minutes. Uh, next, we have a couple of technical support people here, Jeremy Stroud and Joe Olivar are our tech support. If you have are having any problems, um, you can send them a message in chat and they will see what they can do to help you on your end. And I wanted to say that this webinar is brought to you by the Washington State Library and the Institute of Museum and Library Services, who is our funder. And I think that's my last slide. So I wanted to tell you that today we have an excellent webinar about zines and we have two zine librarians here that I wanted to introduce to you. The first is Kelsey Smith and she is an adult services librarian, librarian senior, pardon me, at the Lacey Timberland Library. Hello. She's also an organizer for the annual Olympia Zine Fest and a collective member of the Community Print Letterpress Studio in Olympia. Washington. <laughs> Kelsey, Kelsey founded the zine collection at the Olympia Timberland Library, which is now thriving under the care of her co-worker, Agatha Burstein. Um, the Lacey Timberland Library's new zine collection launched in July, and anecdotally, I am, want you all to know that I'd never heard of a zine until I met Kelsey, and she has just totally pulled me into it, and I know that this will happen for you all too. Our second presenter is Agatha Burstein, and she's a librarian in adult services at the Olympia Timberland Library, where she maintains the zine collection and runs a zine club, among many other things. She's also a founding organizer, along with Kelsey, of the annual Olympia Zine Fest. And they are going to tell you all about zines, and by the time this is over, you're gonna know more than you did before, and um, take it away, you guys. Thanks everyone for coming. This is really exciting and thank you Nono for inviting us. Uh, I'm Agatha. This is my voice. I'm Kelsey. This is my voice. <laughs> and we're going to get started. Okay. Things to the front. Yeah. All right. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, what a zine is. So um, it's, it's uh, I'm, I'm assuming that most of you, if you're tuning into this, that you're familiar with what a zine is, but just just in case, usually um, foundation is in order. Um, so the first thing is that you pronounce it like zine, like bean. Um, a lot of people call them zines, and um, that's fine. It's fine, but that's not what they're called. They're called zines. <laughs> if you think of it as short for magazine, that, that makes it um, a little bit easier to remember. Um, here's a couple of definitions of what a zine is. Um, one is from Barnard Library, our friend Jenna Friedman, who's a zine librarian at Barnard College and um, one of our zine heroes. And then uh, Stolen Sharpie Revolution is kind of a seminal uh, book about zines by Alex Breck. Um, so that's another definition. And next slide. This is um, a poster that Aggie made for when we do outreach events on the left. Um, it, it's a it's a good resource for people that might not be familiar with zines because they can kind of look at it and absorb the information themselves instead of having to ask us. Some people don't feel comfortable with that. And then the image on the right is something that our friend um, and fellow zine test organizer and coworker Naomi Bell drew. Um, it's zine cast. So yeah. Um, just a little more about zines. They're customarily created by physically cutting and gluing text and images together onto a master flat, and then they're usually photocopied. Um, a lot of people like to use typewriters and clip art when they're creating zines, but a lot of people also create them on computers. Um, any, you know, people draw them by hand. Any, any way that works for you is, is fine. Okay, well, next slide. All right, so why zines in libraries? So I'll just kind of read off this list. Counterculture expression. They're insightful indicators of current times and past ephemera. They represent the underrepresented, give voice to marginalized concepts and perspectives. Interesting and cheap. 
the big selling point. <laughs> <laughs> you can get a lot for a little bit uh, of budget. Um, and they go along with most public libraries' missions of providing access to all types of information. So it really makes sense to have access to zines and libraries if you want to provide a complete collection of many voices and serve all patrons with all types of points of view and experiences. So this is about um, making the pitch for your zine library. So um, when, when I first came up with the idea for um, a zine collection at the Timberland Library System, I originally talked to my boss, Sarah Pate, and she was on board, and then I talked to my manager, who at the time was Cheryl Haywood, who is now the director, um, and then they suggested that I pitch it to our collection services department. Um, so that was kind of the, the ladder of operations. Uh, this is just kind of some suggestions for how to kind of prepare if you're thinking about starting a zine collection in your library. Uh, it helps if you have a really solid plan lined up before you approach the decision makers in your library or library system. Uh, we sh you should have a rough budget. Our budget started with a proposal that was um, back in, I think, 2007. Um, for $500 per year, which at that time could purchase at least 200 zines per year. Um, at that time, zines were, you know, a buck, two bucks, sometimes three bucks. And now they're getting a little bit more expensive as people kind of pursue like the art aspect of zines, but they're still almost always under $10, so pretty inexpensive. Um, we also included in our budget materials for processing zines, which included like comic bags and backers. Um, we process our zines by subject using color-coded stickers. So we included the stickers in the budget and then other supplies related to shelving and organization of the zines, just kind of any money that might end up being spent. Um, and then also have a rough estimate of staff time. Um, don't be afraid to suggest using volunteers or interns if you think it will help your case. Uh, in Olympia, uh, people were really enthused about the notion of a zine collection, so um, I had a number of people that were interested in helping, and so we mentioned that in our initial proposal. Um, you'll want to figure out where your collection might go. If you have been to the Olympia Library, you know that um, space is at a pre premium there. So kind of figuring out like the best spot for it before you even start the proposal um, and then any furniture needs you might have. And then um, reasons for starting a zine collection. And, you know, in Olympia, we, we um, some of the reasons we used were kind of on that previous slide that Aggie just talked about. And tie your reasons to your specific community. Uh, another good tip would be to anticipate and meet any concerns that might crop up. Um, zines sometimes have controversial content since they reflect unique points of view. And the ALA freedom to read statement is on your side. <laughs> and in that, in that same thought process, you um, want to create a collection development policy, um, either in the pitch or kind of, you know, make a plan to create a collection development policy that includes reasons for the collection as well as how to address concerns. And Aggie's going to talk a little bit more about the collection development policy. And then include examples. Um, a lot of times the zines themselves can be really charming um, and just, you know, having some to show to the people so they can kind of get a sense of, of the unique format and content and provide examples of other libraries that have zine collections. And if they're um, successful, go ahead and highlight those. And once we had the manager of our collection services department on board with the idea, we were set. And that was Judy Cobell and um, Tim Storbeck. Those were the two people that kind of made it happen. So, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So acquisition of zines. Um, there's a lot of options here, actually. Um, I took, I pulled some info out from something called the Zine Librarian Code of Ethics, 
which we'll link to at the end, which is a collaborative document that a bunch of zine librarians made to, to address a, a bunch of different kind of ethical concerns. And one part of that is about acquisition. And so they gave kind of an order of preference, ethically, uh, best ways to acquire new zines. So the best supposedly is just directly from the author or zine maker, which you can often do online or at uh, your local zine fest, which happens in most every city. Um, then the second best would be from a distributor or distro, just kind of like what it sounds like. Uh, like a zine store. Yeah, like a zine store. They kind of aggregate a curated collection and then they table at Zine Fest or they have a website. So it's a way for individual zine makers to get their zines out there. So they kind of sell it to the distro and the distro will sell them out. Um, so if I'm doing like a big order, I kind of prefer a distro so I don't have to do shipping and handling from every single little zine store. So it just depends if you're doing big orders or a little at a time. Um, and then also you could accept donations or even solicit them if you don't have like a budget. Um, the zine community is very generous when asked for uh, donations, um, but they, they do know like if you do have a budget, that's not a super ethical thing to do, to ask for donations. So it depends where you're at. And then there's one option that's not actually in the Zine Librarian Code of Ethics, but that I do, and would depend on your community and if it's popular, which is printing copies from the internet, which tend to be sort of anarchist and punk zines, that are a lot of like DIY, like informational zines, not a lot of like personal zines, but just people who make zines and want them to be printed and distributed are out there. And one good example uh, of a website with a lot of those um, at Sprout Distro, and they're just PDFs you can print out and throw in your collection for free if you think that's something your patrons would want. And then my tip is just that since zines normally cost a few dollars, a small budget goes a long way. And like Kelsey said, uh, we started with like a five, I think it's still around that 500. And with the donations that I, I get without even asking and printing for free, and then at Zine Fest, you can often get a deal because you'll be like, I want to spend. $10, what do you give me? And you'll get a bunch of zines. And people love donating the library. So all in all, $500, you probably still get like 200 or more out of that a year. So on to cataloging. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about cataloging themes. So um, this is an example of a zine called Alien Boy, which um, was about a young man who lived in Portland, Oregon. Um, you can see kind of on the lower right all of the stickers all over this zine. Um, so this particular one is kind of unique because it also had like a little um, CD in it or uh, yeah, like a, a CD-ROM or um, a DVD. So it has that green sticker letting you know that. It's got a barcode. It's got a location sticker. So that's the branch that, that this particular zine we, lives at. Um, and then it's got the, the cutter with the first 11 letters of the zine. And then um, on the bottom, you can see all the subject stickers for this particular zine. Um, most zines have multiple subjects, so um, cataloging them can be a little bit challenging. And we do the subject heading assignment um, in the branches. So we note everything, we add those stickers, uh, before we send them in for processing, and then we send them to Kitty, um, our cataloger, our zine cataloger, um, and she adds all the subject headings to the catalog and, you know, title, author, etc. cetera. Um, so this particular zine has activism, it has uh, mental health, it has a collaborative or split zine. We have to make that sticker by hand by cutting those little stickers in half. That was a bad thing that I came up with when we first started this that I now regret. Um, but that basically just means that there was more than one author for this scene. And um, local and Northwest uh, made, mm -hmm. made locally. And there's a bunch of other subjects. So next slide. So this, this is just to give you a sense of what the catalog looks like. So on the left is our staff OPAC, um, Symphony. 
and that shows you all the subject headings that Kitty has entered. So you can search for, you know, collaborative zines and you'll come up with a list of collaborative zines or local and northwest zines. And then on the right is what you would see in the public catalog. Um, and so it just gives people a lot more um, options for searching. We originally were just going to kind of very minimally catalog our zines. Um, but again, the, the folks in collection services decided to fully catalog them. So this is one of the only, um, it's, I think it might be the only collection that we do original cataloging on. Uh, most of our cataloging is copy cataloging. Mm -hmm. And I know Kitty enjoys cataloging scenes. So, mm -hmm. okay, next slide. Mm -hmm. All right. So now we'll move on to shelving, and I have an example here from Vancouver Public Library. I'll move on, I have a few more examples. Um, so like Kelsey said, we're super, super lucky to have a cataloging department or just a way um, of cataloging the zines by subject, which means we can shelve them at our library by just alphabetical order of title. And the reason I think that's lucky is because some libraries that don't have cataloging capability, they kind of have to shelve them by subject so that people can find them. And that can be very limiting. So let's say um, you have a zine in front of you and you don't know where to put it because it's personal, it's a comic, and it's about mental health. So do you put it in personal, comic, or mental health? I don't know how to help you with that. <laughs> but we just get to put them alphabetical and catalog them in the catalog as personal, mental, and health, and comics. So here's some examples. Denver Zine Library, they do it by subject. Barnard, and then this little zine library is actually in Olympia, but it's at a coffee shop, and it's put on by the Zine Fest people. I think, yeah, here we go. This is my library, and on the left is what it used to look like when it was first started and, and recently, sort of in the last year, I was able to move it into drawers um, that used to house CDs and it's much easier to browse when it's front facing. It's, it's so much, much better. It's oh much but, uh, more nice to look at, but it was really hard to browse over uh, when they were spying out because they don't have spines. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, it's nice now. And I had, they let me make a new z uh, zine sign that's hanging from the ceiling. It's so nice. So, if you're ever in Olympia, come in and say hi to me and check out the scenes here. And that's about it for shelving. One more. Oh, one more. This is Lacey's new collection, which I haven't even seen yet. <laughs> <laughs> that's in a, um, a record, a record box. So like if you were in a record store um, browsing through records, it's the same, mm -hmm. same concept. Um, and then, you know, dividers by the alphabet which relates to the title. Very cool. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about Zener's advisory. Um, this is a term that, that I made up. It's basically reader's advisory for zines. So how to introduce zines to readers who aren't necessarily zinesters. That might be something um, that um, they're unfamiliar with. So um, the, the regular reader's advisory process is like you you know, you probably all know this. Tell me about a book you've read and enjoyed. Um, you kind of pick out appeal characteristics from the conversation you're having with your patron. Um, and then you have a reader's advisory conversation where you suggest some titles. Um, and again, like the appeal characteristics are usually story, character, setting, language, and format. Um, so those all apply to zines as well. So there's, there's you know, lots of good reasons to read zines. Um, they're really short, so they're a quick read. So if somebody has like a short attention span um, or maybe reading is not easy for them, um, they're quick and they're really visual usually. Some of the zines are more text heavy, but often they're, they're very visual. Um, they reflect unique points of view so people can kind of identify aspects of themselves within um, zine culture. They're unfiltered. They're just, you know, from the person's brain right onto the page. Um, they have strong visual appeal and aesthetic quality. And um, often you can't find a lot of the subject matter and zines in books. Um, so for kind of unique, um, unique 
social issues and things like that, um, zines are a really great resource for that. And often they're really personal. So you feel like you're kind of really, you know, getting to know somebody by reading their zines. Um, a, a good way to kind of introduce people to zines is kind of pursuing this concept of crossover zines. So there's a lot of DIY and how-to zines. Um, so if, if somebody's looking to learn how to do something specific, you can kind of give them a zine instead of a book. Um, there, like an example of that would be like how to how to start doing screen printing with with a minimal budget, or um, how to start a a show venue in your house. Um, Nonfiction zines that tell true stories. Um, it's a good way to kind of again like if somebody likes to read nonfiction books, you can kind of introduce them to non nonfiction zines. Um, if people enjoy biographies and memoirs, you can introduce them to the concept of a perzine, which is just like a personal scene. So um, that's just where people kind of write about their lives. Uh, comics, there's tons of comic scenes. So if somebody's into graphic novels, you can introduce them to that. Um, poetry. And then uh, just other ways to kind of introduce scenes and sort of incorporate them into your collection is to write reviews um, or make lists of scenes. So we do a lot of that. Um, and Aggie does a really awesome job of that. She makes scenes that have lists of scenes in them. So sometimes when people don't know where to start, it's nice to have kind of a, a smaller list. Um, incorporate them into displays and social media. And then the hand sell, which is where you literally just like hand it to somebody and say, you would like this. Um, and that, that's something that um, libraries do already. So next slide. Cool. Okay, so programming, uh, I'll talk about this. I think it's, it can be really important if you're gonna have a zine library to sort of interact with it and not just have it sitting there passively and hoping that people will get the idea. Programming really helps. A lot of people come to programs and they don't know at all what they're going, what's going to happen there, and they find out, and it's really great. So um, every year for International Zine Month, which is a thing started by Alex Reck, who wrote Stolen Sharpie Revolution, um, is July. So we've had for eight or nine, nine years now, mm -hmm. every summer, a 24 hour zine thing challenge where um, it doesn't actually last 24 hours, although it's once it did. Year. <laughs> Never again. Um, <laughs> but it's a good span of time. This year it was 1 to 7 p.m. And the idea is they would finish it elsewhere within 24 hours. But you put out all the materials to make zines. We roll the copier in there and let people use it. and we always make a collaborative scene, so every all attendees have the option of just making a page that goes in there, and it would be like a different theme each year. This year's theme was regret. It was so good. And a lot of people like to just start there, or that's the only thing they might do if it's too overwhelming to make a whole scene. But that's an annual summer event, and then in the last maybe a year ago, I started a monthly zine club which is still figuring out what it is. <laughs> but I wanted um, people who make scenes and write scenes to meet each other because it can sometimes be a very solo activity. And I know there's a whole community in Olympia, but a lot of people don't know each other. So that's been really cool to just have people meet each other. And I usually plan an activity or have a guest speaker at those. Um, so we talk to you more about that. Oh yeah, and then we always have snacks at our programs because we're lucky to have a really robust Friends of the Library group that um, always offers to pay for snacks and people come. I hope not just for that reason, but <laughs> it does help. Um, and then the one on the right is, this is gonna be our third annual Zine Fest in Olympia and the three out of three, we've kicked it off at the library um, with a special kickoff event and this year's is a zenithon with a bunch of things going on and in the past we've had like a panel and a music show so partnering with uh if your city has a zine fest those are definitely some people to talk to um, and work on ways of working together because it just makes sense to do that uh, okay and then here's 
some pictures Kelsey added uh, <laughs> of some programs. We're actually going to talk a little bit about outreach. Oh, this is outreach. Yeah. Sorry, so, my bad. Oh, that's okay. Um, so, so for outreach, um, you know, getting getting the word out there about zines and your zine collection um, is is sometimes like an uphill uphill battle. Um, so, the more places you can kind of introduce the concept of zines, the better. Um, some of the outreach that we've done in the past um, are drop-in zine workshops at Rosie's Place, which is um, a drop-in center through Community Youth Services in Olympia that serves um, primarily street-dependent youth aged 12 to 24. Mm -hmm. So um, doing workshops with, with those kids, um, that was a really fun uh, outreach event. We've done um, zine workshops at Cap Capital Recovery Community Mental Health Center. And uh, one time we did that, we created a collaborative zine about mental health that was really awesome. Um, I really loved the way it came out. People wrote about like different meds they were on and how they affected them um, and, you know, uh, how, they, how, they, how they got through the day. Um, experiencing depression. It was a really poignant scene. Um, we have done Adult Swim, which is an after hours event at the Hands-On Children's Museum. Uh, that was a collaboration between the Olympia Zine Fest and the Timberland Regional Library. So um, on the, oh, I, I, I didn't end up doing a picture of that one, but yeah, that was, a, that was really fun. People were um, in kind of a festive mood and there was alcohol. So we, we really got uh, a lot of participation in the zine making table at that particular event. Um, and that was just a couple months ago. And then we did a zine making station at the, Zo at the Nova School Makers Fair, which was also a collaboration between the Zine Fest and Timberland. And that's the picture on the upper left. That's um, a couple of my coworkers um, from Timberlin and then my co-organizer for the Zine Fest, Melanie Shelton. Um, it was really fun. We have and a question from the audience yeah. here. Um, Mark is asking, what is pro kink? Pro kink? Where do you see that? Uh, <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> oh, well, let me annotate on your board there. Let me see. <laughs> pro kink. He sees it on, the, it on, on the, your uh, board. Oh, I don't know what the, I don't know what that is. That was so that that um, board was from going to the Portland Zine Symposium and doing um, a presentation about about Zeners advisory. Um, at the end of that presentation, we brainstormed about what people would like to see for see for Zine recommendation list. Um, and that was one of the suggestions. So I'm not actually, oh, pro kink. I'll bet it was pro kink. So, you know, kinky scenes. Yeah. <laughs> you asked. <laughs> uh, but that was just some of the subjects that people came up with at that particular one. I thought the, I thought the list was pretty interesting. Um, and then the picture on the right is my daughter, who I made table for me one year so that I could go around and buy scenes. And she's sitting with Matthew Murray, who um, writes the Two Fisted Librarian theme. And then that's Rachel Lee Carmen on her right, who's an amazing zinger as well. Um, so I I, um, I recommend involving your child so you can go shopping. And then um, we've also just getting back to the uh, outreach. We've spoken to classes at Evergreen, South Puget Sound Community College, and St. Martin's University about the concept of zines. Um, we've talked to Evergreen multiple times, and I think Aggie has talked to SPSCC yeah, a couple times. Sometimes teachers just come in and, and ask if I'll talk to their class because they want to give a zine assignment, and um, sometimes I'm able to, which is really cool, or the class can come in and I can talk to them there, and that's another cool outreach opportunity. Um, and then just a couple of other outreach options are uh, participating in any fest that might be happening in your town. So the Olympia Comics Festival and the Olympia Zine Fest. Um, we have organizers for the Zine Fest that also work for the library. In fact, several of us. Um, and like the library has tabled at both of those events with zines and graphic novels. 
and allowed people to check out directly from the table if they have their library cards. So uh, just kind of centering the library as a resource for, for those kinds of materials. Um, okay. Okay. So promotion sort of goes along with that, um, but I have a few things to shout out here. Um, I recently started an Instagram uh, for the zine library and zine collection, but I'm calling it a zine library uh, on Instagram. If you want to add Olympia zine library, pretty poppin'. Um, that circle you circled is still there, but now it's no longer relevant. <laughs> it's on one of the posts I'm, I put here, but. Instagram is, is pretty good for promoting scenes. Uh, I was surprised. I sort of just started it not knowing if it would take off, but I have like 550 followers within a couple of months and it's like very active. So, and people have reached out to me on Instagram saying, how do I donate my scene? And it's been a really cool way to just feel way more connected to the community than I was before as kind of part of an institution. Um, and people have found out a lot more about the Zine Library and the different events that we have. Um, another way of promoting um, is just to put out there, this, this is like in the middle, actually a piece of paper I would print out and just have by the collection. Um, before I did this, people did not realize that we had these things. Um, they're not supposed to be secret, but <laughs> you know how it is hard to, to sometimes tell everyone all of the different things the library has for them. Um, but this puts it all on paper, and I kind of call it my no excuses list because we kind of have everything that you would need to make a theme for free, minus color copies. But there mm -hmm. that is. Um, and then I threw in displays there. This one is for International Zine Month, and so it was all zine related, um, including anthologies, which are like more like published books of long running zines, which are really nice to have too. But of course, you can always incorporate scenes into any display, which we try to do, um, almost any display, depending on the theme, you can find scenes to go along with that. Like right now, we have a climate change display, and I have a few scenes in there. So that, that's another way. And there's that cool, um, what the zine board again. Yeah, I threw that up there where, wherever it feels helpful. <laughs> so great. <laughs> and by the way, our craft hounds are all missing. So if you happen to have craft hounds and you'd like to donate it to the <laughs> library, it's very expensive now. So right. um, get in touch. Very sad. Um, but those were great clip art books that people could photocopy or scan and then yeah. use. Uh, and someone just stole them without checking them out and they I hope they would come back but it's been like six months or yeah. more so all right this is just a short resource list because um if you actually you can't click that link but let me put that in the we'll, chat box. we'll add it into the chat box I'll put it in the chat box because yeah. we made a, a sort of extensive resource list um at this google doc but we just wanted to shout out um the zine librarian unconference what did it start in 2012 or so? I I no, it was way earlier. Than earlier it was than like, that. Okay. Um, I feel like it was 2008 or 2009, maybe, because it was not long and after. I made a tiny URL. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the Zine Librarians on Conference is basically just a, an opportunity every year to go and hang out with Zine Librarians. And it could be um, a Zine Librarian that's running an independent Zine Library um, that's not, you know, like a, a public library or an academic library. Um, it also can include folks that like Milo um, and Milo Miller and um, Chris both do QZAP, which is the Queer Zine Archive Project, um, which is a digital zine collection that you can access online, and they, they attend um, whenever they can. Um, and, you know, it's, a, it's just a really great way to connect with people that um, feel passionate about zines and libraries. It's in a different place every year. Uh, they just had one in San Diego. San Diego? Long Beach? Long Beach, yeah, yeah, yep, this year, we didn't get to Yeah, it. it's always free, um, they, they try to make it so it's really accessible for people to come. Um, yeah, there's more info if you just Google that or it's on our our big resource list. Um, the second thing, Zine Pavilion at, at ALA and PLA, they, I think it's, it's 
there's sort of a core group that does it and different people help each year. I think it's been at other um, conferences as well, but these, was these two are the main one, ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's basically part of the exhibitor section of the conference and it's a big zine expo where they have people who make zines table and so you can look at and buy for, straight from them and they'll have people there to like answer questions and they will put on a reading or some sort of like little event so just look for that if you're ever at a conference it's a total refuge away from mm -hmm. the exhibit floor because it's um awesome and yeah they have comfortable chairs too. so the resource <laughs> link i've i've pasted a tiny url into the chat box um i don't know if you could still see my screen but it looks like this so there's a lot more and we've sort of annotated it with descriptions and these are all great places to find more information and, and one more shout out to the zine fest it's october 13th through 15th coming up um we hope that you will come um we've got you know a pre-fest event at the library and then tabling all day saturday workshops um an evening reading um and um workshops all day on sunday as well so and it's all free unless you buy zines <laughs> which you should okay so we're open to questions now if anyone has any questions. How do you preserve zines from the wear and tear by the public? <laughs> That's a really good question. It um, is a good question. And it was recently asked on the Facebook group for zine librarians, and there's a whole bunch of answers there. Um, for us, we use comic book boards and backing. It's like plastic sleeve. I don't know if I can go back. If you can see there, they are, each zine has like a white board as its back, and so it's stiff and it and it lasts. They last a long time, and it, it's really good for transport, like in a backpack. Um, if they weren't in that, they would definitely get all torn and dirty. You had a shot of the Lacey zine collection, I think, which had a nice close up of yeah. one of those boards. So they just slip right in there and slip right out. Yeah. And we do check them out in those in those bags and backers, and people have gotten used to kind of bringing them back. Mm -hmm. um, and if they don't bring them back, we just make a new one. So, um, but at the same time, we're not an archive, and we understand that scenes are sort of ephemeral, and they don't always come back to us. And that's just part of the fun of it, I guess. Uh, we try, <laughs> but it's like we're ne we're never gonna. They, yeah. The alternative is you don't let people check them out, and um, I don't think that's it's worth that preservation. Is there are that. a lot of academic libraries that use zines as um, as a, an archive or as you know a non-circulating collection, and a lot of times they um, they kind of work with that by allowing for free photocopies and things like that. But um, yeah, it's a it's a tough decision to make. So. So uh, Stephanie actually put something in Q&A. Um, it says, how much, if any, problems do you have with theft of zines from your collection? Mm -hmm. um, they get stolen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like again, so they're, they're between, um, you know, usually between a dollar and like $10 at the most. Um, so, you know, we just, we just, that's just attrition. That's just kind of the way it goes. and. Sometimes that can be really um, frustrating because sometimes um, zines are only created for like a finite period of time, um, particularly if it's something that has kind of like historical context, like any zines from like the early 90s in Olympia that um, talk about, you know, the riot girl movement and all of the activism that was going on then. When those get stolen, that's it, they're, they're gone. Sad, yeah. um, but that's just kind of, um, that's that's one of the realities of having a public library zine collection that is actually circulating. So. Right. Um, I'd say it's on par with with the books. Mm -hmm. They all took or a stolen. Yeah, yeah, in my library, <laughs> yeah. and they're much more expensive. Yeah, so. 
And, you know, sometimes we can replace those scenes, but mm -hmm. often we can't. And then they're right. just gone. That's just kind of the way it goes. Right. Um, but I don't know if I said, but we have over like 2,800 mm -hmm. in, in Olympia right now. And that little collection in Lacey, we actually just inherited because it wasn't really um, working out very well in the Yelm in the Yelm Library. So they kind of decided um, that they needed the floor space, and so um, we took that collection on in Lacey. I wanted to, anyways. Um, so it was a yeah. good excuse. <laughs> so no, no, <laughs> and that was 500, about 500. Cool. So Nono just shouted out the Washington State Library's uh, historical yes, scene contest. Yeah, we forgot to mention that. We even put it in our notes. Yeah, right. uh, which is it's, uh, it's going to be the third year. Kelsey and I both judge for it um, because the Timberland Library is sort of a partner in that way, and so is the State Archive. So sh shout that out to your patrons. I think I'm going to have that be uh, what we do at the next scene club, maybe, is look at that. The idea is to look at all the digital archives available with the archi state archive and state library resources and um, or go in there and, and yeah, look at their actual actual archive and make a make a zine about any aspect of history and there are different age categories for prizes and you can look at past winners on that link too so definitely look into that and look at the glore and wonder zine yeah the like first the year winner was great ever. um so and then i apologize for sharing the link in a way that People couldn't see it, but it looks like now you can see it. Yeah, and apologies. We'll that's that's the default <laughs> chat op chat option for panelists. If you don't know to change it or you forget to change it, right. it only goes to panelists. Uh, right. No worries. <laughs> okay, let's uh, try to get through the rest. So, um, are most of your zine creations uh, participants, adults, kids, or a bit of both? You're trying to appeal to more of the younger readers. Oh, let's so, talk about um, zine camp. Yeah, so <laughs> there's a lot there. Um, I've seen some people, be, like the only way they can get a zine collection into their library is to sort of say it's for teens or say it's for kids. I think we're really lucky to not have to do that because zine community is actually predominantly adult and a lot of the content is ranging from adult to very adult, yeah. <laughs> depending. Although teens, yeah, teens, teens make zines for sure. For sure. Teens yeah. make sense, teens for sure. But because they have our, a lot of feelings, at like Zine Club, we <laughs> I sort I basically say it's, it's eighteen plus, um, unless they're really a mature teen. Um, but yeah, I like that it's kind of more of an adult thing. But it's definitely kid friendly. Like the the annual summer workshop is all ages. Sometimes we've done like a kids collaborative zine and an adults collaborative zine. Just in. And one of our organizers, Sage Adderley, um, just for the first year this year, um, she runs Sweet Candy Distro, um, and she um, is a mom, and she she would love to um, have more kids making zines. So she started um, a zine camp this year, and she ran it for uh, two two sessions for a week, and the kids made zines um in in the camp and then we um showed those at a gallery show that we had at gallery boom and they were amazing and then we also at the zine um at the zine fest we have a youth table so kids can sign up um and table and trade and sell their zines um we're doing one to two hour shifts depending on how many kids are interested this year so if you know any kids um, in the area that might be interested in that, we're going to have a registration for that up on our website probably today or tomorrow. Uh, but yeah, kids make zines too. Definitely. Um, yeah. So the youth department helps with that. I'll let them know when I have an event that's kid friendly and they'll shout it out to them. Um, there's definitely kids by and for, or zines by and for kids in the collection, but I would say it's not something that's trying to target youth. Yeah. It's um, located pretty far from the youth area. Yeah. And that leads me to the next co uh, question about disclaimers, warning of subject matter. That's not something we do. We don't do that for any of our materials at the library. And our policy is sort of to have um, parents be in charge of that if they care. Yeah, um, we and it's addressed in our collection development right. policy as well. Um, so we, we make sure it's, it's not really, it doesn't look like it's targeting youth and it's far away from the youth collection. So just 
one of our catalog subject areas is kids zines and one is teens. So you can always find them that way, but they're all mixed in. Yeah. So moving on, do you back up your essential zines by photo copying them? We do not. That's have sort it. of ethically ambiguous because right. people don't always um, necessarily want their zines to be photocopied. Um, some of the ones like Aggie mentioned that are online that are, you know, yeah. archives that are existing to photocopy or print out, um, that's, that's fine. Um, but not everybody mm -hmm. wants, you know, usually if you, if you're doing photocopies, you would want to ask um, the, the zine holder first. Right. And I've heard of some libraries when they buy or take donations, they get two copies and they get one, they put one out and they keep one tucked away. But I've just never done that. Yeah. Sort of we don't like, really I'd rather for it. Yeah, I'd rather get more <laughs> single copies than less double copies and then try to keep track of all of that. So um, what other questions do we that's have? That's it for now. So I put our email addresses there. We're available for future reference. Yep. And if that's it. You guys, yeah. this is Nono back again. This was really, Hello. really great. It was very interesting, and I really appreciate all the just kind of nuts and bolts practicality that you talked about and how someone could help, could start a collection at their own library. I thought that was really useful, and I also would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sticking through all the, <laughs> <laughs> the painful software adjustment in the beginning so thank you very much and um i know that this this will be watched in recording a lot because it it's a it's a really great um webinar so thank you and thank uh, you and kelsey will have to have that coffee soon <laughs> yes do it <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Right. Right. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank Bye. you, everyone.